Amen. Amen. There is no love like the love of our Savior. We can search for our entire lives looking for a love that's greater than His and we'll never find it. There's never been a love like His before His, and there will never be another one greater than His love. His love is the greatest love of all. And His love is here, and His love is now, and His love is for us, and His love is with us, and His love is real and true. And it's something that we can have every day of our lives. The love of Jesus. There's never been a, a greater love. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for your faithful presence. Thank you for your kindness to us. And even, then, even when we didn't deserve it, even when we were not worthy, you've shown your love to us and your kindness. We could never be worthy of your awesome, amazing, great love. But yet every day you say to us, child, take my love, receive my love. And God, today with open hearts and open hands, we say, Jesus, we come to you. We receive of your love. We are satisfied in your love. We're overwhelmed in your love. All that you have is what we want. So God, today, we turn our hearts to you. We turn our hearts to your love. We turn our hearts to your kindness. And we say yes. We say yes. We thank you for your faithfulness, dear God. God, we pray today that you would continue to move upon our hearts, continue to help us grow in understanding of who you are and in closeness with you. We commit our time unto you. We commit our day to you. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. All right, another amazing time in the presence of God. I hope you guys were just as blessed as we were. Today is Father's Day. Today is Father's Day. And so I want to say to all you fathers, thank you. Thank you for being the head of the home. Thank you for loving your children. Thank you for being an example of faith and love. Thank you for all that you have done, all the sacrifices that you make for your family every day of every year. Today, we celebrate you. And we want to say to all those fathers out there, thank you, thank you, thank you. And if you're a child, if you're if you're a son or a daughter, I want to encourage you. Do something special for your father today. Give him a call. Say hello to him. Take him out for lunch. Take him out for dinner later on tonight. Or maybe during this week, go have coffee with him and just express your thankfulness to him. Because a lot of times fathers go unthanked, unappreciated. And so today... I want to encourage you. This is what we're doing on Father's Day. We're remembering, thanking our fathers. We take that time and say, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your sacrifice. So to all those fathers out there, thank you and God bless you. Today, it's kind of cool because it's Father's Day, but we're also talking about love and kindness. Uh, we've been going through uh, a series we just started a couple weeks ago on love and it's based out of 1 Corinthians 13 and it's talking about uh, love is patient, love is kind and we're going through the whole passage in 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 to 7. 
Two weeks ago, we talked about the introduction. Last week, we talked about how love is patient. And the whole idea behind love is patient is that love is long-spirited. We talked about that last week. We talked about how love has the end in mind. It's not just thinking about today. It's not just thinking about the way that things are today. But it's thinking about, okay, what's, what are the results going to be in the future? Let's not just think about how things are affected today, but let's think about the long term, the end game, the, the, the long term plan. And that's what love does. It looks not just with eyes that only see today, but it's, it's a love that looks with eyes of faith. Today we're going to continue in this series, but let's read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7 just as a reminder of what we're talking about. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 7, it says, Love suffers long, or love is patient, and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That's 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. So last week we talked about love is patient. Today we're going to talk about love is kind. What I want to do today is we're going to look at a few verses that talk about God's kindness to us. Because in everything, God is our example of love. It says in the Bible, it says that this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And so we're always starting with God's love first. If we, if we look at love based on a human definition of love or how humans love, it's going to be a flawed definition of love. And so what we have to do is we have to look at who God is, we have to look at God's love towards us and his example towards us at all times. And then from there, we can say, okay, this is God's love for us. This is God's love for me. How can I let God's love flow out from me, that same love flowing out from me to other people as well? And so that's what we're going to be doing. As we do this, as we look at all of these uh, points about love, love is patient, love is kind, I also want us to remember how similar, how similar the fruit of the Spirit is to this list of love. Okay? How similar the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, kindness, and self-control. There's a lot of things in that that overlap with this definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13. And so as we do this, as we look at love, let's always remember the Holy Spirit. Let's always remember that this is who God is, this is who we're supposed to be, but we're not doing it just on our own strength. The Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is with us. And it wants to empower us with the strength that we need to live lives like Jesus lived. He is our example. And if the fruit of the Spirit is love, that's one of the, the lists that we're talking about. You know, that's the whole definition of this list in 1 Corinthians 13. But it's the fruit of the Spirit. And so we need the Holy Spirit in our lives filling us in order to be able to show that love and continue to show that love to others. So always remember the work of the Holy Spirit in and through you as we look at these definitions of love. So let's look at what love is. Or sorry, let's look at what kindness is since that's what we're looking at today. To be kind, it means to be a blessing. It's to do something good or useful for another person. It's basically, it's helping somebody. And it doesn't say to be good or to help someone who 
is like you or who loves you or you have a good relationship with, it doesn't define that in the relationship. It just says to be useful, to do something good. And so kindness is when we are useful to somebody else. We do something that is good and useful and helpful to other people. Let's look at a few verses. I want to look at a few verses, then we're going to read a story uh, from the Old Testament about kindness. But before we do that, I want to read a few verses. First one is in Romans 2, verse 4. Now, I want you to, I want to focus on the kindness aspect of this. Let's observe where we see kindness in this. Romans 2, verse 4, it says, or do, you not, or, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? So it is God's kindness to us that leads us to repentance. It's not God's judgment on us. It's not God showing himself in power and mighty strength. No, it's God's kindness to us. God's been kind to us. God knows our lives. He knows what we need. He knows our needs and he knows our, our, our failings and our weaknesses. But he's kind to us. And it's, this verse says that it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Here's another verse in Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 7. It says, God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So this is the kindness, everything that God does for us. Not just the salvation, not just saving us from our sins and giving us a new life full of peace and joy, but it's raising us up, seating us in heavenly places, all because of his kindness to us. It's his kindness, it's his love towards us. Here's another one in Titus. When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. So it's saying, this is, he saved us, but it wasn't because of anything that we did. Not because of your righteousness or keeping the Ten Commandments or walking the line, not going to the right or to... No, he says none of that matters. It's his kindness. It's his kindness towards us. And yes, of course, we have to respond to that. We have to respond to that kindness in faith. But it's his kindness. According to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, who he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. This is the kindness of God. That even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he died for us. And he raises us up. We believe in faith. He raises us up, seats us in heavenly places. All of this is done because of God's kindness. Love is kind. Love is kind. God knew what we needed. And in his kindness, he said, all right, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to supply it. I'm going to make way for it. I'm going to make it ready. Everything that you need, not because of who you are, but because of my kindness. Let's read a story in the Old Testament. This is a story of King David and kindness that he showed. All right? Before we get into the story, I want, to, I want us to see the relationship between David and Saul's son, Jonathan. Okay? So Saul was the first king of Israel. David was the second king of Israel. 
Jonathan was Saul's son. And normally in those days, the son of the king would be the next king. But David was anointed king, okay, even before he became king. And this story happens after David killed Goliath, and I want you to hear the language that's used in here and the relationship that David had with Saul's son, Jonathan. This is 1 Samuel 18, verses 1 to 4. As soon as he finished speaking to Saul, so this is talking about David. As soon as David finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit together with the soul of David. So their souls were knit together, it says. And Jonathan loved David as his own soul. And Saul took David that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and his sword and his bow and his belt. So David and Jonathan make this agreement, make this covenant together. Their souls were knit together. This is a very, very special bond, a very, very special relationship between these two. That David and Jonathan were so close and so knit together. And there was a, a very intimate, close relationship between the two of them. As the story goes, you know, Saul wasn't, he was anointed king, but he was the, the he, he wasn't the greatest of kings. He didn't follow God with all of his heart. And David beca began his training as the next king. And it was God's special way of training him and leading him. And, and so eventually, David became the king after Saul and Jonathan died on the battlefield. And there, after, after Saul died, David made a promise. He said, I'm not going to raise my hand against any of, Saul's, uh, any of Saul's family. I'm not going to try to get rid of my enemies, those people who are trying to kill me. What ended up happening is, is David became, be, became king and was lifted up, and, and God gave him charge over all of Israel. He became the king who served and was the shepherd king over all of Israel because he, had a, he was a man after God's own heart. And there was a lot of things that were happening, but, God, but, but David understood about how to show kindness. And this is what he said in, in 2 Samuel chapter 9. I'm going to read this whole, this whole story here in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 to 11. So there was a lot of fighting after, after Saul and Jonathan died. There was a few different people who were trying to become king. But God lifted David up, and David said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try and get rid of my enemies. I'm not, going to try and I'm not going to kill anybody. I will let God lift me up if he wants to. And so that was his heart. When he finally was established as king... This is what he said in 2 Samuel 9. David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul? Okay, so some of them were killed. Some of them died in battle. But David wanted to know, Is there anybody else who is left who are descendants from Saul? He said, That I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. He said, I want to know. He said to his, his servants, he said, is there anybody left from Saul's family? Because I want to show them kindness because of my relationship with Jonathan. We were so close together. We were so, such good friends. There was such a bond between us. And he was thinking about that, that relationship that he had with Jonathan. And he said to his servants, he said, hey, is there anybody out there who is a descendant of Saul, a descendant of Jonathan, that I can show them kindness. And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. All right? So Ziba was Saul's servant when Saul was still alive. So they called Ziba to come to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? 
And he said, yes, I am your servant. The king said, is there, any, is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I can show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan, but he is crippled in his feet. Okay, so this is 2 Samuel 9. What I want to do right now is I want to go back and read a short passage from 2 Samuel chapter 4. Okay, Jonathan, the son of Saul, this is from 2 Samuel 4 verse 4. Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. This son was five years old when, he, when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. So Saul and Jonathan had gone into battle. They died in battle, and the news came back to Jonathan's house. Okay? So the news came back from Jezreel, and Saul's son's nurse took him up, took, took the boy up, and fled. But as she ran in her haste, she fell, and he became lame. Okay? So the son of Jonathan was five years old with the nurse at home, the news comes back from the battlefield that, that Saul, the king, and Jonathan, the prince, died in battle. So the nurse takes up Jonathan's son and runs to get away because she figured, the enemies are coming, I gotta get out of here. As she was running, she drops this, the son, falls on his feet, breaks his feet or something, and he became lame. And this verse says the son's name was Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. Everybody say Mephibosheth. Turn to your neighbor and say Mephibosheth. Turn to your other neighbor and say Gesundheit. God bless you. All right. Sounds like you're sneezing when you say Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. Oh, God bless you. Yeah, okay. All right. So his name is Mephibosheth. All right. So now let's go back to the passage in 2 Samuel chapter 9. So we know the background of this son, Mephibosheth. He's been lame since he was five years old when his nurse dropped him, and he became lame. So here he is. He's this cripple. He can't get around by himself. He needs help going here and going, to, uh, going there, doing this and doing that. But he's the son of Jonathan and the grandson of King Saul. Okay, and David said, is there anybody around here? Is there someone that I can show kindness to because of Jonathan? So, then he was talking to Ziba the son, and the king said to him, getting back to uh, 1 Samuel 9 here, verse 4, the king said to him, where is he? Ziba said to the king, he is in the house of Maker the son of Amiel at Lodabar. Then king David sent and brought Mephibosheth from the house of Maker, and Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage to him. And David said, Mephibosheth. And, he, and Mephibosheth answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear. Okay? So in those days, the way to establish yourself as king is to get rid of all of the descendants of the previous king. But David said, no, I'm not going to do that. Mephibosheth was afraid because he was a direct descendant from Saul, and he would have been in line as the next king if, if they followed the, the, the lineage from, 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 from Saul. But David said, no, don't be afraid. I will show you kindness. And once again, look at this. He says, I'm going to show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I'm going to show you kindness not because of your sake, but because of the sake of your father, Jonathan. And he said, I'm going to restore to you all the land of Saul and all the land of your father, and you will eat at my table always. Always. You're going to be sitting at my table every day. Okay? And Mephibosheth paid him homage and said, What is your servant? Who am I? that you should show regard for a, for a dead dog such as I. Then David, King David called Ziba and said to him, everything that belonged to Saul and to all his house, I'm giving to Mephibosheth, to your master's grandson. You are his servant. Do, you know, serve him. 
and you and your sons, okay? So listen to this. He was commanding Ziba. King David said to Ziba, you and all of your sons and all of your servants shall, shall work the land for him and bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will always eat at my table. So da King David is saying, everything that Saul had now belongs to Mephibosheth. The servants, everything belongs to Mephibosheth. The servants are going to work for him. They're going to prepare the land. They're going to plant every single year. So Mephibosheth is going to have an income. Mephibosheth is going to sit at the king's table every single day and eat with the king, with King David. And it says here, Ziba had 15 sons. He had a massive family. 15 sons and 20 servants. So 35 people serving Mephibosheth. He was nothing. He was just a cripple before. Now he's got 35 servants. He's got land. He's living great. He's sitting at the king's table. The, then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will, you, will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. That's David's kindness to a dead dog. Let's see if he called himself. Mephibosheth called himself a dead dog like Mephibosheth. That's kindness. There's some key points in here. I think the main point is that we can all learn is kindness is shown. David show, showed kindness to Mephibosheth, not because of who Mephibosheth was, but because of David's relationship to Jonathan. David had this close, intimate relationship with Jonathan. Their souls were knit together. They had a, there was such a bond, a fondness there for each other. And David said three times in there, he said, because of the kind, because I'm going to show you kindness because of your father, Jonathan. God also shows kindness to us. Not because of who we are, but because of his son. Because of his son, Jesus. Jesus sacrificed, Jesus gave, Jesus made a way, Jesus paid the price. And that's God's kindness to us. We're like Mephibosheth. We're like dead dogs. We don't deserve it. Even in our trespasses and sins, God shows his kindness to us. Who deserves that? No, but God said, because of my son Jesus, because of my relationship with somebody else, I'm going to show kindness to you. And every day, we have the right to come into the king's house. We have a right to sit at the king's table, to eat the best food in the land, to have all of the provisions because of God's kindness to us. Not because of who we are. You think about it. David would have had the greatest guests from all the lands coming and sitting at his table. He would have had kings from other countries, prime ministers from here, this person and that person. The best of the, the surrounding lands would come and sit at his table. And every day, oh, here comes Mephibosheth. They'd probably have to carry him in, or they'd probably come in, and maybe they got a little cart for him, or maybe he was hobbling in on crutches. And everybody would be like, who's this guy? Who's this guy? Here, here he is. He's coming and sitting with kings and royalty. He's coming and sitting with the best of the best. And everybody's like, man, who's this guy? Mephibosheth. He's a cripple. He can't even walk. And then everybody would start talking and they would say, this is David's kindness. This is the kindness of King David that someone like Mephibosheth has a right to sit at the king's table. That's like us. Who, who, who are we? Who am I? 
that the greatest blessings in all the universe would be poured out upon us. This is God's kindness to us. He welcomes us in, even though we have not done anything and we could not do anything. Mephibosheth didn't do anything for King David. He couldn't have done anything for King David. He didn't work the land. He wasn't a great you know, farmer or anything like that. He wasn't a good shepherd. He couldn't even walk. No, it was simply based on the kindness of King David. God's kindness to us cost him something. God, David's kindness to Mephibosheth cost him something. Every day he was providing for somebody. God's kindness to us cost us his own son so that we can come into relationships, so that we can sit at his table. God's kindness to us is visible to all and undeserved. We don't deserve it, but his kindness to us is, is just that way. God's kindness to us is based on the actions and God's relationship with another person, Jesus. Because of David's relationship with Jonathan and because of God's relationship with his son, we are shown kindness. It's not something that we can do or even grasp on our own. No, it's just God's kindness. God's kindness to us. So, how can we show kindness to others? Number one, don't look for people who deserve it. If you're thinking this way, if you're thinking, I'm going to show kindness to this person because of what they did for me, that's not the kindness that the Bible talks about. The kindness that the Bible talks about is seeing someone who could never pay you back, who could never do anything to deserve it. That's, and showing kindness to them, helping them in their need, pouring out to them, giving to them, loving on them, showing them love and kindness. This could even be somebody who is mean to you, who is an enemy to you. The Bible says love your enemies. But us showing kindness to them is not based on what their actions are to us, but on God's actions to us and because of that relationship that we have with him, we can show kindness to other people. Understand also that kindness costs. Okay? When you're kind to someone, when you're helpful to someone, it's going to cost you. I love the series that we did back in May when we're talking about generosity. Okay? That love and that kindness, doing things for other people, is using the resources that we have to show kindness, to show generosity to other people. Our kindness should never be based on what we can get back from it. Our kindness is not based on what that person can or will do for us, but our kindness is based on the actions and our relationship with another person, and that's Jesus. As we think about kindness, Love always starts with God. This is love, not that we loved God, that he loved us. It always starts with him. And if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you will know the kindness of Jesus. Maybe you've seen his kindness in mercy. Maybe you've seen his kindness in his provision. Maybe you've seen his kindness in encouragement and strength. Maybe you've seen his, his kindness in just the day-to-day -day faithfulness of him to you. But live from that kindness. Show kindness to others because of that relationship that you have with him. David showed kindness to Mephibosheth because of his relationship with Jonathan. We show kindness to others because of our relationship with Jesus. God is so good and he's so kind to us. 
He welcomes us in, sits us at the table, give us, gives us the best food, and we don't even deserve it. My question to you is how can you show that kindness to others? How can you show that kindness to others? Think about those people who are around you. Maybe it's your neighbors who they've been mean to you or they've been persecuting you. They're making fun of you because you're a Christian. How can you show kindness to them? Do they deserve it? No. Do we deserve it? No. But God asks us, show kindness to them. Let the Holy Spirit work in you, work through you. Ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, who can I show kindness to? How can I show kindness to them? Because it's by our love that people will know that we have that, this relationship with God. It's by our love towards others. When we're misunderstood, we still love, we still show kindness. When we're treated not so well, we can still show love and kindness. Let's pray together. Hallelujah. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for such a clear picture in your word, a clear illustration of your kindness to us. God, we were just like Mephibosheth, undeserving. We couldn't bring anything to the table. We couldn't bring anything to the relationship with you, but because of your relationship with another, you showed kindness to us. And God, as Christians, as people who follow you, as followers of Jesus, we want to do the same for those around us. So God, today, we open up our hearts and say, Holy Spirit, work in us. I encourage you, as you're watching this, just say this, this say, the same prayer in your heart and in your spirit. Holy Spirit, work upon my heart. Make me more kind. Help me to live with the knowledge, with the understanding, with the gratefulness of my relationship with Jesus. But based on that relationship, I can show kindness to others. Open your heart to the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit talk to you and show you, lead you. And as you're showing kindness to someone who is maybe unworthy, maybe unlovely, I guarantee you that you will have a more intimate understanding and closeness with Jesus than you did before. Because that's Jesus' heart for you. And I just want to encourage you. I just want to encourage you with that. Show kindness. Open yourself up to the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit, who can I show kindness to this week? How can I show kindness to somebody? Maybe it's being generous. Maybe it's being, maybe it's, maybe it's just forgiving somebody and saying, okay, you know, this happened and this happened, but I don't want there to be anything between us. I want openness and honesty and forgiveness. And maybe it's confessing something, repenting of something to somebody. Let the Spirit just lead you and guide you and ask Him, how can I show kindness? God is with us. God's working in us. God's using the Spirit and the, Ho the Holy Spirit and, and the things of the Spirit to, 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 to help us to grow, but also as a result of that growing, other people are going to see Him. Other people are going to know His love. Other people are going to come to knowledge and faith in Jesus because when we allow God's Spirit to work in us, many more people will be drawn to Him. Amen. Thank you guys so much for joining with us today. Just want to remind you all, we have small groups. Join small group every single week. We can't get together in big groups, but we can get together in small groups. Encourage, 
pray for one another, worship together. Also, if you have any prayer requests, please get in contact with us. We'd love to know you and, and uh, walk together through, through anything that you're facing, whether you need prayer for healing, if you need prayer for fi uh, finances, if you need prayer for relationships, anything like that, just send us a text, call us. We'd be happy to pray with you guys. And also all of our information for continuing to give your tithes and offerings, that's all, all on the screen there as well. Thank you guys so much. Once again, blessings to all the fathers out there. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for being leaders in our homes and in our families. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Amen.